Now, some women traders at the Bogulishi market here in Accra say they are uncomfortable resuming business following last week's violent clash that left two people dead there. When journeys visited the market Tuesday, they pointed to stores they said remained closed because their owners had been threatened by rival faction in the clash. They said until the issue was thoroughly resolved, they would feel unsafe doing business there. Anodame has the rest in this report. Today I'm back here, not to talk about the clashes, but to find out the impact that this particular misunderstanding had particularly on mothers and how they are picking up after the incident. Okay, the way I'm charging now so what Auntie Memuna is saying is that the day of the incident, she was in the room, so she did not see actually what happened. But by the time she came out, everything she sells was destroyed. The drinks were stolen. The, the, the glass in which she sells her food stuffs were, were got broken, and the pieces were in the stew, so she couldn't even use it anymore. Her appeal is that this particular issue does not happening here anymore because it has really affected her business. She has to go for a loan to be able to start all over again. Auntie Beatrice is also saying that she's a seamstress and uh, on the day of the incident she she saw exactly what happened. Some people were being stabbed and so she's very, very, very fearful. You can even actually hear it in her voice as she speaks. She's so fearful that she does she cannot even go to her shop any longer. According to her, nothing was stolen in the shop, but the kiosk in which she's, she sits in was broken, and so she has to repair it, which is another cost to her business. <laughs> But Naomi is here, she is not happy because she went to her shop. Apparently when the issue happened uh, some days ago, her shop was destroyed. So she went there this morning to at least fix the lock and the doors. But according to her, some guy, some gentleman came there and told her to stop because he doesn't see the need why she should repair it. And then he went for reinforcement. Other gentlemen joined him and they came and they took it over her shop. And so she has quickly run to her office to find out if um, her chairman and the other executives can help her. Because of the crashes, a lot of things has gone down. Uh, these are the uh, export, for export promotion yams. We send them to supply, we supply to our customers at various uh, points. But because of the fight, in fact, things have gone down. The farmers are not willing to bring their yams to risk their life. And therefore, the market has lost a lot of things during the uh, few weeks uh, after crashes. So we are uh, really in trouble these days. Well, meanwhile, leadership of the market has been registering some residents and traders who were being evicted. Chairman of the Kunkumba Yam Market Association, Noel ah Noah ah Hassan, tells you on his day, data will be sent to the IGP for further action to be taken. The people, we have an injury uh, up to now. Some people have, uh, they are locking their room. They are destroying some people's uh, property. So those people, they are calling there to come and write your name, to know what happened, who is doing this to you. That's what I've been doing right now. So after that, what will you do with the data that you collect? Yeah, the data we have collect, I'll prepare to meet, if you can meet IGP, to give uh, evidence we have about what happens, then it happened in the back there. Now, ministries, departments and agencies will now have the opportunity to engage stakeholders in their various sectors at a 
monthly national summit. This summit is to provide the MDA as a platform to communicate policy and programs to targeted share stakeholders. Through this, government intends to build partnerships and obtain feedback to enhance policy development. Information Minister Mustafa Hamid says the ministry will each month focus on a selected MDA or sector and through that engagement provide tailored information, build partnerships and gather feedback to benefit all sectors. The national policy summits are going to be occasional summits that we shall hold um, in the course of every year to allow for citizens buy-in into government programs and projects. For example, we just read the budget. A budget is the government's own national economic and financial planning for the year. Okay? That is on our part. But what is the avenue, what is the platform that will allow citizens to critically digest the various segments of the budget and to criticize it and give us suggestions so that as we go along governing the country, we can at all points in time ensure that we are carrying along the views, the criticisms, and the suggestions of the citizenry. So the National Policy Summits are dialogue series, if you want, that would allow stakeholders of the various sectors of our economy to come around the table look at our programs, criticize them, give us suggestions so that we can improve them constantly as we go on. You know, like I said during the launch, an unexamined life is not worth living. So these policy summits are the avenues for us to constantly re-examine our programs and to continually make them better. More importantly, with the views of the citizens inputted in them. The very first summit is slated for early one, May 1 for May 1 and 2 and will focus on the economy. Government hopes the National Policy Summit will inform the public on what is being done to better the economy. The economy is the biggest challenge inherited by the Akufuado government and also the sector that has received the biggest share of government's policy attention in these first three months of our governance. Having delivered a budget that commences the exercise of correcting the challenges of the economy and sowing the seeds for growth and jobs, we are now ready to tell our story and to stimulate the needed partnerships for results. It is our expectations that through this unique platform of National Policy Summit, the public will be informed on the details of our strategies on revamping the economy and encourage people to own these policies, as well as on our part, to enable us explain the policies and programs to all, including other stakeholders, um, Ghanaian people, both national and international people in the diaspora, everybody that is concerned with the development of our country, so that at any point in time, it is not only our ideas as a government that are running this country, but that we ensure that at any point in time, there are multiple of ideas that we are collecting to, as, as, as it is said, constantly update and review government programs and projects with a view to making them better. And at any point in time, it is our intention to continually re-examine government programs and projects with a view to correcting the pitfalls and, and, and making the necessary if you want arrangements that will ensure that at every point in time we are doing things not only according to our aspirations and vision but also according to the collective vision of the Ghanaian people. Now President Akufuado on Tuesday interacted with the three surviving former presidents Jerry John Rawlings, John F. J. Kumkufo and John Romani Mahama at the Flagstaff House. Details of the closed door meeting have not been revealed yet but the presidency says the four gentlemen discussed issues bordering on governance. A statement from the presidency says the two-hour meeting was held in a good atmosphere where opinions were exchanged frankly and with mutual respect. President Kufuado has said in his inaugural speech and in its first State of the Nation address, he will draw from the vast experiences and knowledge of the three former leaders regarding issues of national concern. The president, according to the statement, intends to continue consulting the former heads of state. Now, to find out the significance of this move, 
and how it will enhance Ghana's democracy. I've been joined by Dr. Franklin Odro, who is a head of research and programs at the CDD. Hello and uh, good evening. Thank you for making time to join us and to speak with us. Now, how significant is this meeting, apart from the fact that, well, yeah, since the right, we have the right pictures going out and it makes us look good? Well, first of all, good evening to you and, and to your viewers as well. I think it's, it's very significant because, you know, it is uh, the first time that we are witnessing something like this in our fourth public. Uh, it is also significant because uh, it also gives meaning and credibility to the statement that the president made during his inauguration, uh, referring to the fact that he's very lucky to have three former presidents alive. Uh, and the fact that he was looking forward to tap into their knowledge, uh, expertise, experiences uh, to help in government. Uh, it is also important because it also, uh, at least symbolically, uh, suggests that uh, you know, we can disagree during election campaign. We can have different ideological positions. We can uh, say very harsh, difficult things to one another. But matters that are important to this country, matters that will help to promote development uh, and to grow the economy for the people of this country, is something that is not left to one president or one party. And that every person who has had the opportunity to govern this country uh, has potential knowledge and ideas to contribute. So I think it's very healthy. Uh, for, for governance, uh, and it's very positive. Right. It's very easy to see the symbolism of this whole meeting, but do you really think that the president will be any wiser by engaging these three and having this meeting with them? Well, uh, it, it depends on the attitude and the mindset that the president goes into this uh, conversation uh, with. As I said, they may not necessarily agree on every uh, issue, but at least the president can draw on experiences uh, and you know, knowledge as to what you know, his predecessors could have done or how they handled some issues and what kind of lessons that uh, you know, he can draw from their mistakes in the past. Because this, I believe, uh, you know, it's going to be in a closed-door meeting. Uh, you know, if they are candid and if they are open and frank to one another, former presidents should be able to tell this president some of the mistakes that, upon hindsight, they probably wouldn't have done to guide this current president to avoid stepping into some of those uh, pitfalls. So I think it depends on the mindset and the attitude of the president and also of the past president as to what am I going to do in this conversation. Am I going to be frank? Am I going to be open? Am I going to share some of the secrets, some of the things that I learned during my presidency, which I think can help this president? So if all these players see this meeting as contributing to national cohesion, national development, and sort of addressing some of the pertinent national interests, of our country. It will enhance our governance system. It will also contribute to ideas, knowledge, expertise for the president to govern this country. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Franklin Yodro. He's with uh, CDD Ghana. You're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break. And we'll bring you more stories uh, later on. In fact, still to come in the bulletin, minority in parliament has described as her lies, half truths, and propaganda claims made by Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia as the Kufado led administration's achievement in its first 100 days. We have that and a lot more coming up. Stay tuned. The process of the record, Data Bank owns Enterprise Group Asset, 31st December 2015, where we checked. They own the bank uh, enterprise group by 39.6 percent. It's conflict of interest.
Now, minority members of parliament for the National Democratic Congress have described as outright lies, half-truths, and propaganda the claims made by Vice President Dr. Mamadou Bami about the achievements of the kufado led government in its first 100 days in office. At a news conference in Accra on Tuesday, to give their own assessment of the kufado led government, Deputy Minority Leader James Obeja described the first 100 days as one of hardships deceit and broken promises, adding that the NDC will constructively criticize with the view of shepherding the administration so that it does not roll back the clock of progress set in motion by the NDC government. It is sad to say that for a party that claimed to have the men, they have been struggling to find their feet since that shameful inaugural address. They have so far been been unconvincing about their mouth-watering campaign promises. They are not creating jobs for the masses. They are not alleviating hardships. Save for the 110 ministers and deputy apparatchiks. But they are terrorizing Ghanaians by unleashing their several partisan paramilitary forces to achieve parochial ends. As you recall, among other promises in 2016, then candidate Akufuado said he will ensure one, absolute free SHS for SHS education for all GHS students. The Akufuado Baumia government has too early in the day proven our elders' rights. Our others have for a long while held that Agrobe saw a free Anopa. Agrobe saw a free Anopa. <laughs> to which the signs of an enthralling game can be detected right from the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, the early signs of the government of our country under the MPP have been anything but impressive. Instead of an all-action approach towards rolling out their loftily policies and programs, the initial steps in this government through tentative, though tentative, give cause for major concern. Amongst the claims a minority described as false is the reduction of the cost of nursing training and admission forms. Ladies and gentlemen, we have taken note of the Dr. Baumier's 100-day events organized under the auspices of Media Group yesterday. Needless to say, the event itself did not depart from the high dose of propaganda. Half-truth and unsubstantiated claims by Dr. Baumier has become noted for. We will urge Dr. Baumia to be mindful of the fact that he is no longer a running mate, delivering propaganda lectures to partisan crowds for political effects, and that he is now sworn in as the vice president of our republic. Here are some examples of what we speak of. One, the claim by Dr. Baumia that Air France recommencing operation in Ghana is an MPP achievement, is a palpable untruth. Air France, as far back as 8th August 2016, during the elsewhere NDC government, issued a press release that is still available online through simple Google search. <laughs> that starting 28th February 2017, Air France will offer three weekly flights from Accra in Ghana to Paris. Two, the claim that nursing training admission forms sold at 160 Ghana cities and that has been reduced to 100 Ghana cities is another clear case of untruth. Former Deputy Finance Minister Kassel Atu Fortin, who also addressed the news conference, raised a conflict of interest situation, he says, involves Finance Minister Ken Ophoriata in the recent issue of a multi-billion dollar bond by government. 
Finance did not, however, name any company or individual that participated in the sale, except to say that the issuance attracted a number of global portfolio investors, including a very substantial investment in the five, the 15 year bond by a very well respected global financial investor. So let me say that the, the issue did not attract a lot of investors. It was quote for one investor. Yes. From France. Reuters subsequently reported that a senior government official, speaking on condition of anonymity, said Franklin Templeton had participated in the sale. According to the report, Franklin Templeton, high profile bond fund manager Dr. Michael Hessenthal, has taken a substantial position in Ghana's city denominated government bonds. Franklin Templeton Investment Limited is an American global investment management organization founded in 1947. In an unaudited financial semi-annual report of Franklin Templeton Investment Limited, dated 31st December 2016, you can find it on the internet, Honorable Trevor Jean Travgen was named as one of the five board of directors of the firm. He was also described as the chairman of the Enterprise Group Limited in the report. Enterprise Group Limited was, has 10 board of directors Principal among them was Ke Mr. Kelly Gajepo, mm. Group Chief Executive of Enterprise Group, Dr. Angela Ofori Atta, who is mm. the wife of the Finance Minister, mm. Honorable mm. Kelly Ofori Atta. Mm. Who doubles? Who doubles? Mm. Can I take that again? Yeah. 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 Because, because Trevor happens to be a board member of Temperton. And we check, and straight away after checking, you notice that under their unaudited financial statement, it has an address that leads to Ghana. We're speaking on news tonight on Joy FM. Chairman of the Finance Committee of Parliament, Dr. Marcus Ibeboa, says he does not see the conflict of interest situation arising with the sale of the bond. You are dwelling on uh, annual reports, and let's get to the substantive issue, okay? Now, my wife sits on board A, called that Enterprise Group. I'm finance minister. My wife sits on board A, which is the Enterprise Group. A member of board A, which is the Enterprise Group, also sits on board B, which is Templeton. Now, Templeton now purchases Ghana's bond. Where's the conflict of interest? Okay? This is not the first time Templeton is purchasing Ghana's bond. In 2013, they participated in our bond issue. In 2015, they participated in our bond issue. Kedo Foyata was the finance minister at the time. So we go back and investigate those two. It's disappointing. If it is the kind of credibility the NDC are going to hold in opposition, <laughs> I'm sorry. In other news, many young people in Ghana's western region are still looking forward to jobs promised by the MPP government, especially in the oil and gas sector. As the Vice President answered questions at Monday's town hall meeting, my colleague Justice Beidou spent time watching him with some young people in Takradi, the regional capital, from where he is sending this report. Life in the busy markets of Takradi. This is Market Circle, the iconic central business district of the Western Regional Capital that has been a symbol of commerce for years. But the bustling Takrade of old is fast changing since the find of oil. This is the beating heart of Ghana's oil and gas industry. And after six years of exploration, many here say they are still yet to feel a trickle down of oil money. People here are still looking forward to change in the local economy, not least because this region holds a chunk of the country's natural resource reserve. Takwadi has been a traditional stronghold of the NPP, and in the last election, the party had one of its best performances yet in this region, doubling its number of parliamentary seats from 8 in 2012 to 16 
So on a day when the party that promised change for more jobs was to give an account of its rule in 100 days, many were upbeat. Join us in welcoming the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, Al Haji Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia. I've come to one of the points where people have gathered to watch Dr. Baumia speak. One of the people I've met here is Pak Kum Kumsin, a health and safety engineer with a master's degree, still hoping to land a job two years after school. And Paul, who already has a job doing community advocacy in areas affected by oil and gas exploration. How does it make you feel that you didn't really get any clear commitment from the government after 100 days from this address? It's sad. It's sad because uh, even though I'm speaking, I believe I'm speaking for a million or thousands of youth in this uh, coastal district. Because when you listen to such uh, talks or presentations, it seems to inspire you. But that, as I said, the reality on the Gandhi's Youth Initiative, uh, Entrepreneurship Initiative that the Vice President was talking about, it, it has been there a very long time. How many people in this six quota districts have benefited for the, uh, from uh, uh, this initiative? Who and who even knows? So if I want to, if I'm an entrepreneur, I want to even stand something on my own, where, where do I go? And what is the process? Who do I see? And what is the assurance or probability that I will even <laughs> I will benefit from it? A lot of people don't even know. So I see the talk being too much than the, the, the particular things. So I think in general, uh, the youth in this area, I can tell you, I can confidently tell you that a lot of them are really disappointed. Uh, if I am to assess him personally, I would say that he has done well. Because most of the things he has said gives hope to the Ghanaian people that the MPP has a political will, maybe to solve some of the issues affecting this country. The, uh, the government has a lot to do to ensure that people who are affected by oil and gas will have that feel that they are not cheated. So that what happened in Nigeria probably will not happen here in Ghana. Mm. But as to whether this is actually reflecting within these 100 days, if all Ghanaians are having the feel, a practical feel of change in the economy as they all voted, that one is left for the individual to decide. So basically, this is that one street, one factory, and one village, one town. We have one day, one achievement. It may be early days yet. But if the responses I've gathered here are anything to go by, then this NPP government has a lot of expectations to meet. People, including those here in Takradi, are counting down what their verdict would be after the four years. The Only time will tell. To more oil marketing Justice Pedro, so join you. Farmers this year Takradi. are going to get fertilizers at half the price that they were at last year, and we expect this to help this uh, program of. That's still to come in the bulletin. Peasant Farmers Association point to lapses in government planting for food and jobs initiative. It says may undermine its access. Right next door, after the break, we bring you business with Emmanuel Abadiyake. The Peasant Farmers Association is worried government's planting for food and jobs may face difficult challenges because key areas of the campaign have not been well thought out. The campaign to be launched Wednesday at Gosso in the Grand Hafu region is expected to cut down on food imports and also create jobs for about 700,000 people. But speaking in an exclusive interview with Joy News, Programs Officer of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, the umbrella body of over 80% of farmers in Ghana, says imported seed for the program has delayed and government is engaging national service personnel instead of trained extension officers to work on the project. Another key concern is that the qualification of acreage for the program is pegged at five acres or more. This, the association says, will exclude farmers, especially women, who need the support most. Planting for food and jobs is a fantastic program if you are able to implement it well. So launching it in Warsaw, which happened to be middle belt of Ghana, and the food basket of Ghana, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, the program itself is good. Uh, there are three key components 
in that program that we are looking at. We are aware of the problem with uh, extension services. Our research we did in 2018 shows that we have one extension uh, officer providing services to 3,000 families, mm -hmm. which is a very wide gap. So MPP government promised to bridge that gap. And in their manifesto, they promised to bring it down from one uh, extension officer to 3,000 families to one extension officer to 500 families. So that is good. And it's also captured in planting for food and jobs. If they are doing it, look, we continue to provide recommendations on how government will address farmer extension ratio gap. And we are saying that, look, when you go to most of the district assemblies, you have a lot of extension officers who are there. They are not able to reach out to farmers. What are the problems? They are lacking basic facilities like motorbikes to be able to reach out to the farmers. Those who have motorbikes don't have fuel to fuel those motorbikes to visit farmers. They don't have access to internet facility, laptops, and other things. What are we doing with those people? There are people who completed agri training colleges and they place embargo on recruitment. Have we lifted the embargo? They are going to engage national service personnel. And those service personnel will be trained by the district agri uh, 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 offices. So they will go there. I have serious problem with that. So your point is they are not engaging the already trained they should, In the first place, look, extension at, look, offices. At, look at what we have, what we have in the system. The old extension officers who are there, they have nothing to do because of lack of logistics. They have the knowledge. Because they are not equipped. They are not equipped. So let's try to equip them, and now we will now bring more on board to fill in the gap. But you can't go and bring those who have no knowledge in the area. You are going to use just one man to train them to go and provide service to farmers. Is that the case? Do you have That's evidence the case. to show That's the case that is the case? I have spoken. I just came returned from Kintampo, hmm. and I have a lot of extension officers who were looking for us to support them. Mm -hmm. so that they will be able to do these facilities. And they themselves also say they heard that government is recruiting people and those people will come under them so that they will train them. And the point I'm making is that a farmer who is engaged in agriculture business for several years, eh, these people will go there, the farmers would rather school them. We need extension offices, but the approach is wrong. The second one is that the project beneficiaries, mm -hmm. those that they are targeting to benefit the, uh, from the project, we have serious problems with it. The project is saying that for you to be a beneficiary of planting for food and jobs, you might have had five acres or more. If you are saying that you are targeting farmers with five acres and above, majority of farmers over 80% who provide for the agriculture sector have less than five acres, especially the women. So are we leaving all these people out? Did you, were you asked, did you make any input on that? Why we should have the acreage less than five that is the problem the problem is that they sit in the office and design the program i thought you were engaged in this the point is that, that that's the point i'm making they are launching planting for food and jobs we are never invited key stakeholders like us who have majority of farmers on the ground there are not invited and it's not only us there are other farmer associations who have not been invited so who are those who are making the program for so if they were to consult us we would have at least suggested to them that look you have over 80% of farmer population, those who need these services, having less than five acres, especially the women. Are we leaving those people out? So I would have expected that we should rather see that the beneficiaries should be those who have less than five acres, those who are going to plant less than five they acres, not more, more than five acres. Because those who are planting more than five acres, already their capacity has been built. They have the resources to be able to purchase these facilities. So they don't really need the support that much. So there will be another way of supporting them. I well, the National Sea Traders Association of Ghana says it was unable to meet government's demand for sea to be distributed for the campaign, though the planting season has begun. I think with every new program, there's bound to be some challenges. But I think it's a step in the right direction that all Ghanaians should be up and doing. I call it a clarion call and that I think we should all come together and make sure this program becomes a success. Yes, there are challenges, but I believe a lot of us were consulted. There was a committee that was put together with the call strategic a group. I think PFAG happened to be a member. And so those were the stages where some of these issues should have been brought out. Yes. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I also believe 
um, farmers were existing before the NPP government came. Mm -hmm. They are only trying to address some of the challenges. And so by rolling out this program to cater for, or to cater to, like say, uh, five acres per holder or all of that, they were looking at an increase in whatever was existing already because of the subsidy that was being rolled out. So that's just about that. With the extension problem or program that we are talking about, for a longish while now, there's uh, not been any extension recruitment yes. at all. Mm -hmm. And the ratio that Charles rolled one out, to 3, one to 3,000, that has been the issue. Aside of the uh, inadequate human resource, there is also inadequate uh, Logistics. logistical uh, resource. And so, yes, I know they will be equipping them as well, but we need to increase the human resource base. And especially with our students from the tertiaries, like the agricultural students, the university students, most of them are agronomists, but they, 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 this job embargo has sort of curtailed all their movement, and they are going about looking for non-existent white color jobs. So I think for the first quarter, if they've been able to rope in over 1,400 1, farmers, we should encourage them and continue to make the needed inputs as and when we go. That is what I, I believe. Granted, um, there's still a lot of challenges because me, my difficulty has been the consideration of the value chain approach. Okay. which means the market, the processing bit, the pre-processing, even the packaging and all of those. So that's where I sit, mm -hmm. where I, that's where I come from, because I think there was something like that with the buffer stock program. Mm -hmm. But this, we have different categories of, uh, or different varieties of uh, crops that we are expected to do. My, my question is, are we well prepared, especially at the post-harvest level? Mm. The stocks, the storage, the warehousing, the marketing. And this is what I, where I believe we all need to continue to input and see where we can go from here. But so far, do you know the plan? Do you have any idea what the plan is from harvesting down? Ah, uh, that's what we had. I know there's, there's been some verbal uh, promises that there's some markets out there somewhere. I, I can't put a figure on it. But then I believe... Um, which, for instance, with processing and storage and all of that, is still challenging. Mm -hmm. And so I would have loved that this year would have been a pilot and would have mm -hmm. been scaled up as we go. Mm -hmm. That is what I think. Now, every year on April 18, the world celebrates International Day for Monuments and Science. The day is marked with various activities, including visits to monuments and heritage sites. Here in Ghana, join us as Patricia Gasso visited the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum, also known as the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park, and, speaks to, and spoke to Ghanaians on just how much they know about the Nkrumah Mausoleum. The world celebrates monuments and sites across the globe. That is on the 18th of April. Here in Ghana, these sites have become a tourist attraction. People travel far and near to gain knowledge about our monuments and sites. I am at the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum, also known as the Kwame Nkrumah Park. But are we as Ghanaians interested in these monuments and sites? Follow me as I go out there to speak to Ghanaians, especially the youth, if they know about this mausoleum. What I know about the museum is um, he was laid here. That's all I know about it. Who was laid here? In Kuma. Osaji Futa Takakuma. Osaji Futa Takakuma. When he died, he passed away. He was this one, buried over there. That's what I know. The museum there, me and myself, like this, I know that it's Kwame Nkrumah who can build this museum for Ghana. Yeah. Um, and Jerry is the one who went to the body of Kwame Nkrumah at Cape Coast and come there with Kwame Nkrumah and his wife to the museum inside. Um, so in all things we he can use during those times, is there for excursion people to come see everything for the like. He gets some old telescope for the and um, in old T-shirt and coats and um, the undertaker where they go use bury them no, all day there for the uh, excursion people for can watch everything. We've just heard history about it uh, way back in the primary school, but for me, I can't say I know a lot about it. So tell me, what, what were you thought in primary? 
Um, it was just about where Kwame Nkrumah's dead body was buried, you know, and some of his artifacts or things that he left behind were kept out there. You know, that's what I know. In an attempt to get more views, I realized many young people were ignorant about the relevance of the Kwame Nkrumah mausoleum. They shied away from our cameras. The elderly, however, gave what sounded more like a nostalgic account. Others had no knowledge of the subject, hence they turned away. The old, on the other hand, had this to say. This place was built according to what I've been hearing from people. This place was built in uh, remembrance of Kwame Nkrumah. Okay. For what he is the first president of the Republic of Ghana. He has done a lot, you see, and they build this place in his remembrance so that the future generation who are coming, they can see some of his works here, his statue is there, so many things are there. And it's not for Ghanaians alone, it's for the whole world. Okay. People from other foreign countries used to come here and come and see it because Nkrumah is a very great man. A great man indeed, you see. Okay. And he's one of the best leaders we have in Africa here. Or let's say he's the best. It was uh, after Kwame Nkrumah had been overthrown and uh, took exile in Guinea. Yeah. When uh, uh, Another government, that was uh, a champion government, came to power through, through means of coup d'etat. He negotiated with Secretary at that time, and he brought the remains of Kwame Nkrumah. That was 1972. By then, I started working as a young boy, or a young man, you know. And I think this is where the, uh, uh, they re-buried uh, buried him. That's how we had a Muslim. Now, it's become quite common in Accra to see men sporting bushy beards shaped in a particular manner. It turns out it's a new fashion trend. Serena Mandi has been finding out more about what's come to be known as Accra's beard gang. The beard gang is what they are called. And this is what a typical shave looks like. It is common to find, especially with young men who want to make a fashion statement with their beard, wondering what the inspiration is. I caught up with Eugene, who was getting his beard shaved, and he shares his motivation with me. I used to cut it, but my wife says uh, she loves it, and she chews it, you know? Yeah. Okay, sh sh what do you mean by she chews it? Because uh, it's different, you know, people make love, and it's not love if you... You don't feel affection like, you know, you use your man. Everything about your man, you, you have to use it. And then everything about your woman, you use it. Even though they believe they belong to a gang, they do not need to be physically acquainted, but are connected by their values. Julius admits he's a member of the Beard Gang and explains why. A movement kind of thing, you know, people who keep beard and it's you know when when you keep your beard you take a picture you hashtag it beard gang you put it online and all that so it's, it's more like a movement um, in Ghana I've heard about an event that was organized for people with beard and you know it was called a beard gang uh, I was invited for those who do not have enough beard growing but still want to fit in the trend there seems to be a solution creams to assist in beard growth Nana Yao is a men's hair stylist. For those who do not have a lot of beard, we give them a cream to help it grow. For those who have much, we just give them a cream to style it. The one for beard growth is finished, so I need to buy more. What investment does grooming this new beard craze require? When I spend a uh, hundred, I get my shampoo, I get, you know, some kind of uh, pomade to make it look clean and it will last for about three months and more. Having to go to the barber to shave and keep your beard, sometimes it's not even, you know, that your hair is grown or something. You just have to go and trim it to keep it because when, when it grows a lot too, it makes your face look funny or scary. So I would say, well, it's... It's getting a bit higher than I used to when I, when I was keeping my hair normally. 
how do some ladies feel about this especially since it is referred to as the new sex pack I don't have any special attraction to that but um, where well, do I say it's not a specific attraction to me some of them it looks too much so I don't find it decent when it's like too much since the craze for this new beard style has become the way to go we wait to see just how long it takes until it fizzles away Zarina Mandi for Joy News Right, so I don't intend uh, getting a, a six-pack beard. But uh, some news just coming through on myjoyonline.com indicates that the Economic and Organized Crime Office has granted bill to Ibrahim Mahama, brother of ex-president John Mahama. He was picked up earlier Tuesday and interrogated over transactions he said to have engaged in prior to the 2016 elections. Now, details of the transactions for which he was picked uh, sketchy, but reports on my journal line suggest he had issued that checks to the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority at the Tama Port to clear some heavy duty equipment he had imported. Joy News cannot immediately confirm that, but sources close to Yoko said he has been granted bail to report at a later date.